Good evening, everyone. I'm Shomak Shen from St. Xavier's University, Kolkata. The university, in collaboration with Press Club Kolkata and UNICEF Kolkata office, has been organizing this development journalism uh, FDP for the eight days, which started on 14th of, uh, sorry, 17th of this month, and it will continue up to 24th of this month. And it is truly a big thing for all of us, all the audience present over here that we are getting Professor Dr. Minal Chatterjee sir uh, with us today. Uh, let me introduce him in brief. He's basically a journalist as well as a media academician for decades. He has worked in all media forms with Ilan. Presently, he's working as a regional director of the Eastern India campus of the Indian Institute of Mass Communication, Dhenkanal. It's situated in Orissa. Professor Chatterjee has published seven books on journalism and mass communication in English and Oriya, including his seminal work on the history of journalism in Odisha. He has edited an anthology of essays entitled Gandhi as a Journalist and Editor. Our uh, respected Professor Snehashi Shur Sir is also a co-author of this book. It has been published in Oriya language as well. An accomplished fiction writer, Professor Chatterjee, has published seven novels, which is truly a very big thing, and six short story collections, many of which have been translated into several other Indian and foreign languages. And at the same time, he also has been publishing a column entitled Jagite Thiba Jyotidina, sir, if I'm not incorrect in Oriya language. Yeah. And uh, I heard few stories from Sir when he visited our campus at St. Javier's University, Kolkata. So a very nice evening to you and to all the audience. And we all are very much eager to listen to you. So over to you, Sir, and my regards to you as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Pandey, can you hear us now? I can, Sir. I can, Sir. She can, sir. I actually I had muted my speaker and I did not realize it and I realized it after. <laughs> so for the next uh, 60 minutes, we shall be discussing best practices of development journalism. I understand in the last uh, about a week or so, you have been discussing development journalism from different uh, aspects and perspectives. Uh, before I go on and, and talk to you about uh, best practices that precisely mean to me is to talk to, about, uh, talk to you about great stories that has been written in recent years and how uh, development journalists, I mean, I hate to uh, brand some journalists as development journalists, as this journalist, as that journalist, right? Journalists, to me, are basically journalists. They at times focus on a particular subject and they kind of specialize on that subject and they probably are comfortable in more in writing in that subject than others. I mean, that's, that's the way we should look at it. Um, anyways, so today what I'll be doing in the next 58 minutes, first eight minutes, I'll talk about development and the concept of development right and the second uh, the other 50 minutes we will be taking different different examples and discuss and i'll also i am i i, I understand i am talking to teachers who in turn will teach students to engage with development journalism maybe we will discuss how can we do that how can we make them tell stories in and around development in a better way, in different forms, in print, in television, in digital media, right? This is what we are going to do. But before that, let me talk about development, the way I see it, right? I see the development in this way. It has four pillars, nine parameters. And these four pillars are basically one. First is definitely economics. The second pillar, in order to make you understand the second pillar, I have to go back to history. Right. Come what may, history doesn't kind of leave you. It's there everywhere. Now, 
uh, consider days, let me take you 200,000 years ago when Homo sapiens just emerged. Right? And it took them almost over 185,000 years before the dawn of civilization. And this civilization happened when they realized or that they thought that probably there are better ways to live. There are easier ways to live. There are easier ways to find food. Because for a very long time, they were hunter-gatherers. And that's, that's how they used to live, right? And one, gradually they realized that there could be better ways of getting food. They discovered agriculture, right? What is agriculture? Agriculture basically is to produce more food from a given piece of land by controlled way of raising that food, which we call agriculture. Right? They did it. They produced more food. But then there was a problem. The problem was, when they were hunter-gatherer, they can move in the entire forest. Right? Anybody who gets any fruit anywhere is his or hers. Anybody who kills any animal anywhere the flesh of that animal belongs to him or her, or his or her family, or anybody that he or she chooses to give it to. Right? But in this case, he has put in his own labor on a piece of land right? for a very long time. Right? Now, if somebody else comes and takes it away, he's not going to tolerate. This gave rise to two very important pillars of development. One is right. Right over the produce of my toil. Right over my land. Right over my uh, fruit of my toil. Right? That's right. And second, that institution will, which will ensure this right. There has to be you get my point? There has to be some institution which will see that these rights are protected. Right? There is some, then that gave rise to another institution. That institution, call that government, right? Call that administration, call that any which way. But there will be an institution which will frame rules and laws and see that the institution which has been appointed or engaged or raised to protect the right works properly. So now we have three, right? One is right, my right. Second, hmm? institution. Third, governance, right? We were happy for a very long time with these three. Right? And then gradually turned that there has to be something else which will glue, which will act as a glue and make this hold together. And that is collective morality. Collective morality. Otherwise, this society will be fragmented, will be me-centric. Right? So these are the four pillars of development. Now, what are the nine parameters? Definitely, number one is economics, finance, money, right? But money is not the only parameter in which you map development, right? Then comes education, health, liberty, right to freedom, right to exercise my religious affinity so on and so forth there are nine right look at the way the hdi is mapped a pakistani economist devised this for your for your information right and what are the parameters a the, the, the longevity 
the year of schooling, and so on and so forth. There are four actually, right? Why I'm telling you all this? Because all these are part of development. And talking about this constitute a large part of development journalism. So development journalism can take two, two, two clear lines. One, journalism for development. The objective is clean and clear, right? Development is our objective. Second is journalism around uh, development, whether it has been done correctly or not, a road has been laid, whether it has done it has been done correctly or not, right? A project has been sanctioned, whether that has been materialized or not. Looking into that is also looking at development in a way. So in first part, it 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 has a boundary or it has some uh, 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 what some some somewhat some affinity towards public relations, government public relations. In the second part, some affinity towards investigative journalism. Right? So that kind of overlapping or blurring of boundaries will always be there in journalism, right? You cannot look at journalism strictly in silos. Okay. So Having said that, now let's see hmm, how development journalism can be practiced. Right? We have examples before us, examples like P. Saina, who, have, who has been writing on rural, uh, rural problems, uh, hunger, um, Basically, problems that a large population are living in villages they face. His stories, anthology of stories, everybody has probably read that. Everybody loves a good trout. It's a must read for anybody who wants to do what we call quote unquote field reporting or development reporting at the grassroots. Right? In his stories, this is one way of doing this in his stories you will find stories of individuals right and how these individuals were victims mostly of the system in story after story in uh, this book this anthology called everybody loves a good trout which has been translated in very many languages i'm sure in bangla in Uriya, uh, Aveshing has translated this, and it has been translated in, in, into several languages. If you, have, if you read that, you will find this in story after story after story. Stories from Lisa, stories from Andhra Pradesh, from Chhattisgarh, from Bastar, right? Stories of common men who have been victims of system. This is one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is, is of uh, Usha Rai. Usha Rai, for those uh, who are familiar with her writings, I need not repeat. But those of you who are not very familiar, she was uh, a career journalist. And she was into writing uh, on, on development issues, basically. And she was writing with an objective to find out, you know, the solutions. Not only focusing on the problems. Okay, like probably P. Sainath did, or Hars Meander. I'll, I'll come and talk about him as well. Hars Meander did, right? Hars Meander is another tragedy. I'll come back to him. So in this case she was kind of looking at solutions in fact she uh, brought out a manual called journalist as a catalyst journalist as a catalyst right this she did for an international ngo probably 
Oxfam. I'm just right now I'm forgetting with whom. But now she wrote uh, an anthology called Critical Stories of Change. If you, should you want to read more of her uh, her writings, go to the Better India. Uh, dot com. What I'll do at the end of my deliberation, I'll put some information in the chat box. Maybe you can look up to these websites to, to read more about uh, them. Uh, I was talking to you about horse meander, 65 years of age. And she has, uh, he has been uh, writing for a very long time on food issues. Right? He had written one book, The Right to Food Debates, in which was published in 2018. He wrote one titled Ash in the Belly, uh, and it was Indian Unfinished Battle Against Hunger, and this was published in 2012. Right. And he has been consistently writing on issues of, of food and hunger for a very long time. And he used to write in Hindu, and he is still uh, writing in Hindu. Although I haven't seen his write-up for quite some time, about a, about a year or so in Hindu. But anyways, so... Uh, Yeah. Now, having given you three, four examples of present day active, quote unquote, development journalists, let me discuss how do you teach your students to write development stories? As I just told you, Development stories, I told you about the pillars of development and the parameters of development. I also told you that in and around these, whatever you write with a human figure, with the context, the present day context, right, that becomes development stories. Now, how do you teach that to your students? How do you tell them that, look here, these are the best practices, right? Look and, and, and read these stories and write something like this. Not exactly this, but take a clue, see this as, as a template, and please do write something like this. Right? Let me give you some examples. All of you must have read this book called, uh, by Vinod Kapri, One, Two, Three, Two Kilometers, The Long Journey Home. Okay. Maybe many of you have read this. Vinod Kapri, a, a, photo, a documentary filmmaker, right? based in Delhi, one day he found seven, eight uh, uh, people during this COVID time cycling their way. He asked and found that these laborers, they were laborers and they had come from Bihar, right, mid Bihar. And during this COVID time, they found it difficult to live in Delhi. They wanted to go home and there was no transport available. So they tried to go home by cycle. It took them seven days. Right? What Vinod Kapri did, he followed these seven people from Noida to their village in Bihar. This book and this documentary is a story of those seven migrant. Bihari laborers. Right? It told about their, their, their life. It told about their hardship in moving in bicycle from about 
one, two, three, two kilometers. And the total distance was this. And that's why the name, uh, the title of the book is this, right? So maybe you can ask your students and to use this tablet. Maybe you can ask your students when you teach them how do you, you ideate and how do you write stories, maybe you can ask them to observe people hmm, moving somewhere in groups, small groups, right? Asking them, where are you going, right? Maybe if they find it some interesting story, maybe follow them, maybe ask them, maybe get some information. About why are they here? Where are they from? Why are they here? I mean, why did they come to this place in the first first place? Right? In Kolkata, we find people coming from Bihar, coming from rural Odisha, coming from all over eastern India. Right? Each such person, they might have a story. Right? Train your, ask your students to find out these stories. Right? Consider how Binod Kapri has weaved the, the entire book. Maybe, maybe this could be done in 800 word piece. Binod Kapri made a big documentary. This could be done in, say, five minutes video or even less than that ask your students to do that let me tell you about another book in this case the book is jumbo on the edge jumbo on the edge it was written by sanjeev chadda who was an indian forest uh, service officer okay? and he wrote about the the elephants right we have been witnessing this man-animal conflict. And in the years to come, this conflict will only grow because of several reasons, right? India is a land with 120 odd crore of people, right? As, and, and growing forest dwindling. So where do the wild animals go? They will stray into, into habitats and there will be conflict. And elephants are dying every day. In Odisha, in all parts of the, of the country where you have elephants in the wild. Right? So this book is about this, that Jumbo on the Edge. So how do you take the, the, the gist of this book and ask your student to make a story out of it. Ask your uh, student to go to a place where man-animal uh, conflict is there. Let them talk to, uh, to the farmers whose land has been devastated by marauding elephants. Right? And what compensation that farmer has got. Right? Maybe if you, if you look at this from this angle, you get one side of the story, right? And then you talk to a forest official and then look at the data. Combine this three and you get a beautiful stories, development focused story. Get my point? Data can help. Data can help, right? I'm reminded uh, that uh, Dr. Pandey is here. He has done considerable work on, on data aggregation, and big data, and this and that. Data is very helpful, but, but data is not a substitute for going and visiting the place going and visiting that place in first person, which is very important when you write about development. Data can often bamboozle you. Data can often lie. 
if you take it at the macro level. Simple example, right? If you take the data of the depth of a river, right, it could be in summer probably three feet. But there are places where the water could be six feet, eight feet. Anna? So if you aggregate that data, it will be three feet. And if you think that it's a three feet, uh, the depth is three feet, so I can cross the river and you move in, and then you, you get drought. That's the problem. If you do not understand the nuances of data, this has been highlighted in a book called Whole Numbers and Half Truths by a, an author called Rukmini S., who herself was a journalist and a development focused journalist. And she used to work with data, loads of data. Data is very useful. Data is very useful to get a big picture. Very useful. Right? Over a period of date, if, if you have large data over a period of year, you can easily predict the trend and all. But at micro level, right, it's, 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 it's you going to the place and engaging with the people in the field, that is more important. Right? Now, let me talk about this, this that data and, and climate change that reminded me of another phenomenon. Just to sir, uh, uh, tell you, this is the book I was showing. So this is the book you were talking about. That, the book, uh, uh, Rukmini's book? Whole yes, number? yes. Whole numbers and half truth. Yes. 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 Right. Now, uh, talking about data, we have loads of data of rainfall, isn't it? Loads of data. And if you take the data of the last 20 years, right, there has not been a major kind of decrease in the total rainfall. There has not been. Look at data, right? But, but in the last 10, 20 years, agriculture has been impacted. Ask any farmer, any farmer. <coughs> Agriculture has impacted. Why? Then you need to you need to train or ask your students to look at the nuances of data. Look at the mac micro level. Right? Go to the field, look at the micro level, and then look at the big data with nuances. What has happened? Rainfall, total rainfall remaining the same, right? Days in which it used to rain has reduced. And we have more rain at a short period. That precisely mean we get very heavy rain in fewer days in the year. Earlier, it, you, we used to have about 120 days of rain. That's four months, and that's why Chaturmasya. In some uh, religion, this Chaturmasya is a period where you know you have to stay. Bato hai na hi chaar maasho, Odisha the, Bodhay Bangla the hota hai. Why? Because these four months were the months where you will be engaged with agriculture. Bato ki kore kore chala, to jete hobe. That's why four months. Now it has been reduced. So in these four months, we used to have rain. Protein kichu kichu rain, which is needed for agriculture. Right? Now we have that same amount of rain in 80 days. That means we have more rain. And when it rains very heavily, right? Anybody who is familiar with agriculture, except some 
uh, produced, others get negatively impacted. And the rain will, will, will just go and take the, the topsoil away. Topsoil which gives, gives nutrition to your produce. Right? And this will cause rain and flood. Right? This is what is happening across the India now. The urban flooding that you see in our big cities. Bangalore was, was, was kind of flooded the other day when I visited Bangalore. Kolkata, I mean, all of you have experienced the roads of Kolkata during monsoon. Mumbai, Delhi, Pune, good point. People now say, keep the better change hobby. One no maskulo te bas cholbe, ar borsar dine na no ko cholbe. Mana pura service hoi jabe, which is good. Right, you get my point. Why this is happening? This is happening not only because we have clogged the drains. That is a major factor in urban areas. We have kind of clogged all the drains. We have taken over and built big big apartments on on the the water receding system natural water receding systems that we used to have. That's a major factor. But this factor is also there that we are having large amount of rain within a short time. And the infrastructure is, has not been built to handle this amount of rain. Well, therefore flooding. So this will increase. Now here, stories like this has been written, I mean, by, by, by many, right? Maybe you can uh, read this watershed, how, do, how uh, we destroyed India's water, just by Mridula Ramesh, who has been working on water and water use and water conservation system of India, ancient India, medieval India, right, for a very long time. Maybe what you need to do is to send your students to see it for themselves, experience it for themselves, and read these books and come up with stories. Ask them to do this. Right? Ask them to write, to go visit a Baudi in Rajasthan and come back and write. Ask them to do some, some research on Baudi in Rajasthan of large, you know, ponds. Bangladesh at Dighi Bala, Jamindars and, and Rajas, Nawabs, they used to take. Digi. Why? It's not only to show off. It had its its uses, practical uses. Okay. Probably. First, so step one, you tell them about this, teach them in, 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 in uh, your classrooms about water issues, about food issues, and then ask them to read relevant book and ask, identify places where they can do stories easily around that theme, right? And then ask them to write and to do, to write these stories and to shoot these stories and see. This is how probably you can handhold them to write stories, to shoot stories on issues of development. 
Now, Barkhadat has written a great book. Should I say great book? Great probably is a wrong adjective here. Chal. It's a good book. And uh, this was on uh, COVID, during the COVID situation, how people coped with, suffered and coped with the pandemic. He wrote Humans of COVID to Hell and Back. That's the story. That's the title of, of her series of stories, actually. It's an anthology. She talked about people, how they suffered in the hospital. Right? Now, here comes another idea. During COVID, many people suffered because of lack of oxygen. Lack of oxygen. Did we really lack oxygen? Don't we have the production capacity? If you look at how you know, the medical oxygen is produced, just a cursory, uh, just a, a quick search in Google will give you this data, this information that all steel industry, steel plants that uh, we have, they can produce oxygen. In fact, they do produce oxygen. And that oxygen with some more refinement could be used at, in, in medical, in hospitals, right? So what went wrong? Why people were kind of frantically looking for a cylinder of oxygen and some of them had to pay through their nose some of them probably died what happened right now if we ask our students to do some uh, research on that some study on that and take a couple of examples and write a story and then write that no Indian need to die for lack of oxygen because oxygen is actually overproduced. Right? It was a failure of looking at the demand supply, plain and simple. Right? So these are some of the stories which could be written and this is how probably you can guide your your uh, uh, your students to write another uh, probably uh, book that uh, you can read or ask your students to read is the speed and scale an action plan for solving climate solving our climate problems by john Dewar. So what I'm trying to tell you is ask your students to read some good stories that uh, journalists, good journalists, development focused journalists, those who have written on development for a long time, right? They have written. Ask them to read. Okay. I'll give you a uh, couple of websites and couple of places where they can read law, many stories of those writers. It's a good thing that some uh, websites have done is to put together their writings, writings at one place so that somebody can go and read them at one place. Right? Ask your, your students to read them so that they, they get an idea about the way they have to organize their data. But at the uh, risk of getting uh, repetitive, I must tell you that you must ask your students to go to the field, talk to people, observe, and observe as an observer. Not as a journalist, you go, I mean, flip out 
your your notepad and start asking questions right that's not the way you write you 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 write about development you need to have what i call that thera you need to develop that camaraderie you need to create that comfort zone for the for, for the people whom you are talking to so that they can come up to you and 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 bear their hearts out that again is a skill which again you have to teach them this is the skill that you have to develop this is how you go about and mingle with people in settings which you do not you are not very familiar with right the cultural practices of places and how do you conduct yourself which is very important to get into to mix with them right let me give you a couple of examples in i was in mayurbhanj mayurbhanj is a tribal dominated district i was posted as district correspondent in mayurbhanj for uh, about 5 years and I, we used to go to to rural areas their areas and and do stories and mayurbhanj was mostly santal dominated district there are more people from santal community and they have sacred groves which they worship right sacred groves for outsiders i'm talking about 90s right for outsiders i didn't know at that time that these groves are sacred and there are there were no structures temple like structure nothing like that it was little bit cleaner than other forest area and that's it right so we went there right? and uh, and 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 we didn't know that it's a sacred kind of a place and two of us i clearly remember me and my photographer and the photographer wanted to pee right and uh, she went there and then there were some people who saw that and they were mighty angry pissed off with that at that point of time we could understand what happened why was he he so angry but then somebody i mean told us quite angry he was too that is our sacred place so why i am telling you teachers this is that you need to tell the students you need to teach your students about the sensibility about how they should conduct right themselves when they go to the field right the way they need to respect others the, the way they need to respect their knowledge indigenous knowledge let me tell you another story i did a story on an indigenous afforestation initiative it happened because they needed to regrow the forest right uh, if you happen to go to baripada which is the headquarters of bayurbanj district as you enter baripada you will see on both sides of uh, the road the forest stretching to probably to the horizon almost 5000 acres of green lush sal forest okay. the story is like this it was not there after independence before independence moyurbhanj had almost 50% forest coverage after independence we all became independent we thought we can do anything to to any any place so the the forest was gone so these people who used to live in forest who were dependent for very many things on forest they suffered 
They didn't have even food to burn their dead. So one day this gentleman, one old man, she brought villagers together and said Ki, we have to regrow the forest. The good thing about sal forest is you don't have to again plant it to grow. If you just protect whatever is there, right, it will regrow. And there is another lesson. Maybe teachers can tell this to their students that the way we are uh, doing this afforestation program is all, I shouldn't say all bakwas, but most of it are useless. Because if you allow nature to regrow by itself, it will do it itself. But you don't have to go and plant. You just allow them to regrow, just to protect it, which they did. And they were consequently helped by the forestry department. <coughs> they brought, they, they formed, you know, village committees and they started protecting the forest. And five, six years, the forest grew. And, and that was the time when I went there. They told me the story. They told me this also that Babu Jharata Puni Pitilai. Jhara is stream. There was a stream inside the forest. You could point. It was a hilly area. So inside the forest, there was a stream which dried up. But with the forest growing, that stream again came to life. Okay. Why am I telling you this? They had this knowledge that if there is forest cover, there will be streams coming out because the roots will collect this water hold it there and in the rainy season the water the water will sprout out and a spring will be formed they knew this they didn't know the science behind it probably <laughs> probably they didn't know probably why probably they didn't know the science behind but what they knew is that this happened, this could happen, this happens, right? So why I am telling you this? We must, our teachers must teach the students to respect the indigenous knowledge of people living in rural areas, living in tribal areas, right? So, to end my uh, 50 minute deliberation on best practices of development journalism, the end note will be A. Read some good stories yourself. This, these are my advice to the young teachers. <coughs> Read some good development stories yourself i'll be sending you some links so where you can get them right plan stories which could be done by the students okay right? see what additional material the students would need to do these stories teach them how do they get these additional materials how do they get this data from? Where do they get this data from? Teach them to do that. Teach them to aggregate that data. Teach them which source is credible and which is not. Right? And how do you visualize this data? Okay. And then give them a story idea or ask or sit down and ideate. Maybe in future, we can discuss about ideation. How do you come up with an idea? Right? Sit down with your students and ideate. Right? Give them two, three, five, ten ideas. And I'm sure younger they are, their minds are more fertile, and they would come with hundred ideas. Right? 
So discuss those ideas. Ask them to write stories or shoot stories or whatever, or audio story, whatever, right? Give them a timeline. Read their stories, see their videos, right? And honestly analyze them and tell them that this could have been done in this way, this could have been done in that way. This is how probably it will make students more oriented towards development. And this is important and necessary. You know why? Before this class, I just casually Googled you know, great journalists of, uh, of uh, India now, most influential journalists of India now. You know the names I got, right? I'm not telling you, you find it out for yourself. Ten most influential journalists of India. Just Google it and find out the answer for you, for yourself. Right? There are no journalists known for their focus on development. But development requires good manpower. Development requires more attention. Development warrants our attention because development is important. Because 34 crore people are facing hunger in this country, which has more billionaires than probably the rest of, of, of the countries of Asia except Japan. Therefore, development is important. And it's our duty to do this. Now, thank you very much. And I'm open to questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for such an insightful lecture to all of us. It is true that there is a big gap between the students and the journalism, especially the development journalism. We as faculties need to send them to the roots so that they will come to know about what especially and truly the development journalism is. We have uh, already found one uh, faculty, uh, Sitara Puli Venkatesh Madam from St. Javier's University. Madam, would you please uh, write the message in the text box or you can also just share your message. Can I, yes, may yes, I please, please, please voice it out, sir? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, Renal, sir, thank you so much uh, you? for a nice, realistic uh, talk. I really enjoyed it. And I was like, uh, OK, this is the need of the heart kind of a uh, feeling that I had towards your uh, uh, class. So I have this uh, very um, unsettling question, sir. So as you said, uh, field work is something which is very essential that we are not insisting for our students today. Uh, recently, uh, okay, we all work in different kinds of uh, universities and colleges, and uh, we get to have these kinds of students where there is lots of students who are in a very comfortable zone economically, who do not know or do not get to expose themselves to the other classes of our economy. So, for example, when I was working on a specific project and I wanted my students to go talk to the working class group and I wanted them to bring me stories, I, uh, I didn't insist them to go out of their comfort zone inside the university, find out the working class group, which is our housekeeping and security kind of people, try talking to them and bring out that USP that we do not get to see. What I find is there is a lack of empathy among the students. They are only able to give us a, a very peripheral level kind of a story because they are not having that observation eye or, or the eye for what is need to be, you know, significant as an issue. So as teachers, would you advise on how we could bring that empathy to these students who have no idea of what the other class or, or other economic group of our society is going through? This is my question, sir. Sitara, um, I also face that situation here at IIMC. 
yes, there is what I call an empathy deficit. Empathy deficit is rampant in our society and growing. Now we all know this problem and how do we engage with this problem? How do we uh, at least teach our students to be empathetic to people, right? Probably uh, A, you may send these students outside their comfort zone, right? B, Probably you can ask, you cannot force, a year at INC I can, but uh, in some universities you cannot, right? Probably you can ask them to do some manual labor, right? So for example, at IINC, we ask our students to work in the garden. Uh, clean the, the jungle that we have uh, in, in, in our campus bordering our uh, our boundary wall borders a forest and, and there we have a patch of jungle and weeds and all. We ask some of our students to actually clean that. Right? We actually ask them to clean our campus physically. Not with the gloves and this and that and that. Physically, right? We have weaved that at IMC into the syllabus, right? These are some of the work that you have to do, right? Believe me, when they do it, one hour of physical work at the ground, when you touch the soil, when you actually show a seed, there are students who have never in their life have sown a seed in the soil, in the earth. They have never touched raw earth. Many of them did. Chuai did it. When they do that for half an hour, one hour, and there are streams of you know sweat and all, then we have 15, 20 minutes class. We ask them, how do you feel in half an hour work, one hour work? And there are people who are doing this for eight hours a day for the minimum wages, 250 to 300 rupees. Believe me, it works wonders. If you can do that, if you can put them in that situation, I know it's very difficult in certain universities under the present situation. But if you can do that, that will do wonders. Uh, this is probably one way of doing this. <coughs> the other way of doing this is to show them some good films, is to make them read some real good books, right? In which, which probably, probably can impact that thinking process, right? Third way of doing it is ask them to, to, to develop their observation part. How do you look at a, at, a, at, a, at a place? How do you look at some people, right? Uh, I do this in a class uh, room situation, which the class we call critic thinking, right? You ask them to hold anything, say a pencil, right? Focus your entire attention on this pencil, right? And write. 10 lines about it. Feel it with all your senses. Touch. Touch with your tongue. Hold it, right? Consider its smoothness. Look at the, the, the color, right? Keen observation. Look at this, that be, as if this is the only object of the entire world. And you are in these five minutes, you have only this to look at, right? And then write. By doing this, probably by doing this in three, four sessions, probably it improves their observation power. They can see the wrinkle on the face of an old man. They can see the dried up tears 
on the face of a child. Of a bread which is half burnt. उससे पहले वो नोटिस ही नहीं किया होगा आपने उसको एक रोटी दो बोलो यही रोटी को आप देखना है महसूस करना है खाना है और देखना है अप्रूव ऑफ दिन प्लेस यू इम्प्रूव द पावर ऑफ ऑब्जर्वेशन प्रूवली ऑल दिस कैन प्रूवली इम्प्रूव देर एम्पैथी आई कॉल इट एम्पैथी क्वेश्चन प्रूवली इट कैन राइट सिद्ध थैंक यू यस सर थैंक यू सो मच इस और घो Orgo has a question. Yes, Orgo. Uh, Dr. Orgo, you can put your question. Yes, uh, sir. Good evening. Uh, just I, I am listening uh, what you are saying, sir. Just you, I want to make it clear uh, about this. Don't you feel that the development journalism, in especially in India, Pakistan, or Bangladesh, like these countries, the developing countries, is most likely it's biased because the thing is that from Orisha, if you, if I want to give an example. one father he is carrying the dead body of her daughter on his shoulder he hadn't got any ambulance and it's not only in orisha it's in many state of our country apart from that prime minister health minister and the authority they are saying yes gdp is increasing uh, per capita is increasing the growth rate should be 7.5 or like that but what you have said that 34 crores still they are under starvation so wh- where is the uh, wh- where we the journalist or who will teach they will stand there and their focus should be in which point please or go you are talking about dana maji instead right sir, that yes sir that, yes. that uh, person who was carrying the dead body of his child with his daughter leading right Have you yes, visited sir. that place after so many years? What changes have been made there? Right, there have been changes. If you go back and see what media focus can do to that place, right, you will be actually uh, hopeful. I went to Bhavani Patna. Bhavani Patna is the district headquarter of Kalahandi district. Kalahandi, probably all of you know about, yes, isn't yes, it? Yes. Anna, if I ask you about your impression about Kalahandi, you will probably say what? Let me take a quick, quick survey. What's your impression about Kalahandi? Or go. Yes, One line. poverty is uh, poverty malnutrition drought poverty, malnutrition illiteracy this and that right yes good another let me take another uh, opinion uh, devayon are you there no ei to hoy online e ache kintu nei uff online ta boro maya hoye jacche anyway coming back I went to Bhavani Patna, that's the district headquarters, of course, and then I went to interior places as well. Right? I went by a car from Balangir, which is part of KBK. So uh, to uh, Bhavani Patna, and in Bhavani Patna, I went to several places. Right? Believe me, I have seen the change. Hospitals are functioning actually now. Roads are better. In fact, roads are better than many other uh, parts of Odisha. Many other parts of Odisha. Yes, I mean in Dekanal, of course. Right, like good roads, good hospitals, more schools, food. a functioning public distribution system right? i went there myself and i was a journalist um, so i am trained to look at critical with a critical eye right? so what i'm trying to tell you or do that change can happen change is happening 
but way too slowly. That's our problem. Way too slowly. Right? If I give you statistics, probably it will take a long time, but just one. When India became independent, the average age, longevity, was 32. Now it's close to 70. So changes are happening. So we, we don't have to be absolutely disheartened. Not that. It is. But we need to do more to, to continue the pace or better to, to accelerate the pace. That's it. Yes. No, sir. Actually, uh, I uh, my asking was: uh, India is the country where the Ferrari or the most costly cars has been purchased, as well as the starvation death, malnutrition death. It is also been. So, how a journalist can be make the balance? Because his office or the newspaper or the television channel they preferred those due to the ad or something else's. Uh, apart from that, but they have the right to uh, write on that, on the, that focus, what you have said. It's their journalistic point of view. So where, how they should make that balance uh, as a teacher, how do you say to our students, if you focus on it? You tell them the fact this is happening. But what is happening ought not happen. It shouldn't happen. It's not the way we develop. Right? Adani becomes number three rich man, and in uh, 2030, 34 crore people are facing hunger. This is not the way India should develop. Right? Yes. So we will tell the students this, and you can, by practicing journalism of, of I say, of, of substance, right? contribute in reducing this inequality which shouldn't be there i mean there will be some inequality in some form that's okay on the past half the so there will be some inequality that will be always there but it doesn't mean it shouldn't happen like that and and that's precisely why this kind of journalism, which we call, which I call journalism of substance, is more important. And that's why we teachers must kind of tell our students how to do this kind of challenge. Right? And this is difficult to do. Again, fashion journalism bola to shoja. Political journalism bola taro shoja. Anyway, yes. Thank you, sir. Anyone having any question? Okay. Thank you very much, sir, for your oh, Tanushri Mukherjee. Yes, Tanushri, ma'am, can you please put your question yes, as yes. much as possible? Yes, yes. Uh, am I audible, sir? Yes, you are audible because our next speaker is waiting. Please. Yes, yes. No, uh, first of all, thank you so much, Minal, sir, for such an enlightening talk. I just wanted to ask one thing uh, when we are talking about uh, journalism and we're talking about the role of the journalists and the media. I would like to know, sir, valuable insights regarding, you know, the electronic media. When we talk about these people, how much of the developmental stories, you know, they should really focus on and they should really portray because that's a great tragedy that we see nowadays. A great amount of airtime space getting wasted in all kinds of stories. We do not absolutely deserve any kind of a coverage as such, about which we see they're not at all so important, not so significant, affecting the lives of the people. So I feel that the broadcast media, they can really play a very significant role in showcasing some of the grassroots developmental stories taking place at the various nook and corners of the country. So I would like to know what is sir's, you know, expert insight on this. Yes, sir. Please, sir. Uh, Tanushree, uh, 
কোথায় থাকো তুমি Sir, I work in uh, Amity University, Rajasthan. I'm associate professor in journalism and mass communication in Amity University, Rajasthan, sir. Right. And where did you stay? In Jaipur? Yes, sir. I very much stay in Jaipur, in the campus of Amity University, sir. Campus? Campus? Anyway, okay. Yes, yes. It's Wherever you are staying, within... Right. Just, 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 just. Just hear me out. Wherever you are staying, within the in Amity University, there would be a canteen, isn't it? Sure, sir. Sure, sir. Right, sir. And there would be uh, food which will be sold then and there, isn't it? Right, sir. Right, sir. Can you tell me what kind of food is sold there? Do but you sell more? do you so sell more fast food or regular cha uh, ch chawal uh, roti sabji so the both are there yes. it is the yes of the students if they can go what, for a what the students <laughs> the point that yes. i'm trying to make is right uh, which we all know that right. many of us are attracted towards something which is easy to eat and which is more quote unquote tasty. Did you eat my fast food? Yes, sir. So if in a bazaar, you are to sell some food, what are you going to sell? Would you open a fast food stall selling momos and, 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 and uh, pizzas and burgers and this and that? Or at a hotel, but a restaurant, you can eat healthy food. Obviously, you are going to open that. In a bajar. So when media turns into a bajar, and especially so when it when you talk about visual media, which is more capital intensive, they're going for that. However, what is the way out? The way out is to have good stories, and the way out is to ask our viewers to look for good stories in alternative space. There are. I mean, after the DHU, you have the YouTube chat box. I have given you some websites and all. Right? Go to go there. Look at stories. Which are there? People are doing this kind of stories. They need more traction, actually. If they gain more traction, then in the rule of Bajar, the people who are giving you this mindless debates and mindless kind of, uh, of, of, of visuals, which they term as news, they will also turn towards this. That's the point I'm trying to make. This, again, is our duty, teacher's duty. Because we have a bunch of students with impressionable mind. They could be sick, they could be asked to do something, and probably some of them will do. That's the point I'm trying to make. <coughs> with that, I think uh Shoma. Yeah, thank you very much, sir. And uh, we wish that we would be meeting you in St. Javier's University once again, very soon. <laughs> uh, yes, looking forward. This thank is you. really an insightful lecture, not only for the audience present here, but for all what we shall definitely convey to our students. Especially, I would like to mention one thing, the point that you have mentioned, that students, if they would need to know what is development journalism, they must be brought directly to the connection of the roots. Basically, here I and Dr. Reshmi have been teaching this for the last four and a half years over here. And last time, Dr. Reshmi 
have asked the students to create some development journalism related video what have been shown to the university's top officials and they really praised next time when you will be visiting we will try to show it to you sir how our students have connected themselves to the grassroots of the society thank you once again brinal sir